very much. Mahalo do we go. So my first, uh, or very early in the presentations that I've done for our society, back in the year 18, no, 1991, <laughs> in Hawaii, the Pacific Science Congress, and the Society of Economic Botany and Puckability Taskers grabbed in and wanted me to get to my time. So at that meeting in 1991, I talked about cordyline Bruticosa, known as the tea plant. It's a multi-purpose plant in the Pacific. It's a keystone species in, in many respects. Uh, spiritual uh, use to uh, fibers and uh, food, family food, etc. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about another multi-purpose plant. Now, in recent meetings, I've talked about hemp, a cannabis species, uh, in terms of where I, our meetings were. For instance, in front of just a few years ago, I talked about the importance of cordage and uh, our rope and the importance to the British Navy over hundreds uh, of years, perhaps much longer. And then last year in uh, uh, South Africa, I talked about the coming into and spreading out of cannabis where it's used and has been used for perhaps 2,000 years for a psychoactive use and for strong ritual use that was spread. Today I want to talk about its use here in Kentucky where it represents the first major shift from subsistence economy to commercial economy. The rise and fall and maybe the re-rise which I've learned is very contemporary right now and my chauffeur, otherwise known as Michael Thomas, found this in the free, over in the free pile, hemp textiles along with cultivating marijuana book. I don't know how that got in the free time. We're not, we're not talking about that. We're talking about cannabis plants that are used to produce fiber. There's an ongoing debate which my colleague and co-author of our book, University of California Press book, got a uh, reaction from Ernest Smalls, who worked for 40 years in cannabis in Canada, in Canada wrote a 100-page article in the Botanical Review. It's not two species, it's one species, and there's just this chemical uh, differential of producing psychoactive tetrahydrocannabinol. Uh, we rebutted that with a letter. He came back again. You can read all about it in the herbalgram that just came out if you want to get our perspective. There may or may not be two or three species. It may be one species, but there are definitely plants that don't produce or have been selected or naturally evolved that don't produce a very high uh, quantities of tetrahydrocannabinol. We're not really concerned with that today. We're looking at one of its many, many uses, and that's for fiber, and especially here where it became very important and tied into the overall agricultural economy that developed uh, before the Civil War and began in the late 1700s. So just some pictures here to get us warmed up. The fiber uh, growth and collection of both linen and uh, cannabis and they differentiate themselves in uh, Western Eurasia. <clears throat> Use cannabis is, has been used for fiber and other uses all the way from Japan, all the way across to the British Isles. And it is dispersed by birds and I think maybe even fish. We'll talk about that later uh, if you're interested. But the cordage in importance, it's one of the strongest, if not the strongest fiber uh, that's commercially uh, used. There are a few that may have greater tensile strength, but it's very strong, very durable, but until recent uh, chemical innovations and technology is relatively rough. Uh, but it's been used for incredible amounts of different aspects for the fibrous uh, bass fiber in the tall stocks. So, in the Revolutionary War period, as that progressed, the imported hemp uh, became costly in the colonies. Now, George III, the king of England, had wanted tobacco, cotton, hemp as from cannabis as the three main products that he was trying to encourage, if not order or dic a decree that should be produced by the colonists. Hemp is difficult, it has been in many places because it's a labor intensive and if you're going to make high quality to compete with then and up to in recent times, uh, large scale production in Russia, you're not going to have as high quality because of the labor intense uh, work and also the stink involved with uh, the decomposition of the stalks in order to get the long cells, uh, fiber cells, to separate effectively. In uh, 1775, cannabis seeds, uh, according to historic records, 
are introduced into Kentucky, which would develop into the center of the U.S. hemp industry. And the picture on the right is from the uh, turn of the earlier, about 100 years ago. Uh, now, this points out that Russian hemp continued to supply the majority of hemp fiber for American needs. Uh, and some places were uh, rock bottom uh, prices. You can get high quality uh, from our imported and not just from hemp, from sisal and manila hemp, which is not true hemp, but it's made from a musa species or from a banana, fiber of banana. The picture on the right is showing you extensive cultivation uh, some time ago in Russia. As Kentucky, Kentucky hemp eventually achieved commercial success, it contributed to the cotton industry. And uh, the way that was important was cotton could not really be produced effectively to compete with this more southern states in uh, uh, the U.S. at that time. And, uh, but it could produce this fiber which was used for making the sacks to co uh, contain the uh, cotton and also to bind it. And this became the niche that Kentucky fit and the production here without uh, producing the fiber, uh, breaking it down by putting it into ponds or standing water, but rather what we call a do -red. So labor health issues surrounding the malodorous cannabis pond dredding have limited the quality of hemp production, uh, fiber production in the U.S. overall. <clears throat> and that's one of the reasons in uh, Russia, for whatever reasons, they could put it into ponds uh, based on uh, the economy there and the availability of water that would not be too close to residents. Immersion of the fiber stalks in standing water was dangerous, or at least it was considered to be not only a loathsome job, but also generated putrefying stalks. And even back in the 16th century, in Henry the James time in England, there was a statement you cannot uh, put ponds, put your cannabis in there to rip because of the stink, as it said, plain that is uh, <coughs> objectionable to people. So this is a long-standing uh, uh, situation. And in Kentucky and other places, to place the stalks on the ground and let the dew break it down. But it doesn't break it down as, as quickly as you think. So uh, the key aspect here, which we won't go into great detail, is the repugnant aspect. Uh, the labor costs were limited because of slave labor, which was used here in Kentucky to produce, the, uh, to cultivate, harvest, and to set out the redding and collect that and so forth. Uh, this allowed these hemp fibers to compete with uh, the superior Russian uh, hemp, and especially if it was being used to make sacks that were being used and the, uh, the twine, it wasn't it had to be that high quality. So the niche was there, but with the end of the Civil War, the emancipation finally, of the slaves. This changed the technology based on cost-benefit analysis, and uh, nationwide, this agricultural fiber, uh, including the large contingent of hemp fibers in Kentucky, generally shifted to a much better crop, well, tobacco, and we know where that's going. So tobacco became the substitute crop, but it didn't, hemp cultivation did not end. It was still important and was continually cultivated. Now, these are mainly by emancipated slaves or other farmers, uh, but on a limited scale, often with sharecropping uh, or relatively uh, poor farmers. And as a result, over time, there was a downfall uh, of the amount of hemp that was being produced. Part of the problem becomes uh, the invention of light, available, and reusable uh, hoop metal that could be used for the binding for the sacks, and that to play a role in the decline. But a lot of work, a lot of labor uh, that has to go into producing uh, hemp, and that has to be kept into consideration, even with modern inventions, uh, for in terms of the potential rise, which is uh, very prominent today. So finally, the prohibition for cannabis in general, for all uses, obviously for the psychoactivity, which became a big issue, starting around the turn of the century, and built and built until finally, with the tax law, it was completely pro prohibited across the U.S. and uh, until eventually in 1970, Schedule One, no, absolutely no medical uses, et cetera, et cetera. In Kentucky Hemp, I just threw this picture in because it uh, is a place that is very similar to what I believe is the natural area in Eurasia in terms of climate 
and naturalized here and could be found along and still can be found in some places along uh, canals or along riverbeds uh, where there's well-drained soils, uh, fairly rich in nutrients which you're going to find with flowing water depositing that and also uh, where you have um, the uh, ability for the plant to have plenty of sunshine. Now, uh, this is just to point out how important Kentucky yeah. was in the past, and this is just referring to one important place uh, where rope walks, and these are large cordage uh, combined or placed in the ground to allow for stable walkways uh, throughout the year, including during the winter. And those were very important in Europe, and that technology and, and innovation was brought here as well. Uh, Henry Clay, who's uh, the favorite son of uh, uh, at least Lexington, and his estate, which became one of the more uh, productive of all the hemp pr producers during the, before the Civil War period, the antebellum uh, culture uh, and economic giant, relatively speaking, for the commercial production of hemp in Kentucky. Now, his building was, was turned into an 1850, I believe, or 1866, the Agricultural College that was the beginning of the University of Kentucky and they're uh, celebrating this year the 150th anniversary of that. And just a few, uh, a month ago, uh, we have uh, this, this celebration and uh, Kentucky got one of the uh, licenses from the federal government, Hawaii, the state that I've uh, worked in and lived most of my life in, also has one of those within the university system to test growing industrial hemp with approximately a 0 0.03 or 0.3 percent, uh, 0 0.03 percent of THC. So, uh, non-psychoactive cannabis. And here's a picture of what was the original building that eventually became the University of Kentucky. And so, this crop uh, has great significance in Kentucky. And now there is a rise uh, of hemp textiles with the potential for growing although some of the claims that it doesn't need any pesticides, that it can grow it in the same soil for 100 years or more, uh, as um, Hugh from the uh, Land Trust pointed out, these may not be as accurate as possible. However, it has a long history of being grown here and therefore uh, should be considered. Uh, I just want to pay tribute here to a book that was written in 1951 and republished in 98, and that is the uh, history of hemp industry by James, James Hopkins. And we even have uh, your uh, state senator Paul Rand, uh, Rand Paul, and others who are advocating that the uh, uh, hemp should be grown for commercial purposes. And this is it being harvest, the first harvest on the UK or University of Kentucky campus just recently. And uh, this is talking about uh, the hemp production and what might be done. Uh, to legalize it for the production of hemp. So hemp has gone way up and down gradually after the Civil War and may rise again in modern days. So I want to thank you very much. These are some references if you want to. And if you have any questions, uh, you can ask the next the speaker. <laughs>